baptism is. Baptism is done for the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38. Baptism is done to save us, 1 Peter 3.21, Acts 2.40, Mark 16.16. Baptism is done to wash away our sins, Acts 22.16. Baptism is done to be reborn to new life, John 3.5, Romans 6, 3 through 6. Baptism is done to clothe ourselves with Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Trust in the Lord with all your hearts, and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. Praise the Lord, everybody. Yeah. Uh, so glad to speak to you today. This is a cool opportunity to have a opportunity to preach, uh, uh, FaceTime with you guys. So it's a blessing, and thank you for being there today. If there's any uh, blurbs, I apologize for trying to make it roll here the best we can. Amen. If you have your Bibles, the book of Matthew, chapter 7, or chapter 2, I'm sorry, one verses 1 through 3. And verses 7 through 12. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, and verses 7 through 12. I've never preached what I'm about to preach to you today, but I feel in the Holy Ghost uh, a word from the Lord. Matthew 2, verse 1 through 3 says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Verse number 7, Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when ye have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they had saw which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented to him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream, that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. And I want to talk to you this morning from the subject, the opportunity of a lifetime. The opportunity of a lifetime. Let's go ahead and put our Bibles down and pray together. Lord Jesus, have your way in that building. I can feel your presence here in this house. Even though I'm 4,000, 5,000 miles away, I feel your anointing. I feel your spirit. God, have your way in that room today, God. Somehow let this word get into somebody's heart, somebody's life, and change somebody's world today, I pray. In Jesus' name, we give you the glory and the honor. Can we clap our hands one more time for the Lord? Amen. Amen. And you may be seated. Thank you for standing so long. Uh, Every once in a while, if you're really looking for your future, and looking for God to do something in your life, uh, you will encounter the opportunity of a lifetime. Uh, it's just something that happens. And there's different moments that we call uh, opportunities of a lifetime. We go on a vacation, and if it's not a normal vacation to somewhere we've been before, it's some kind of place we never thought we'd get to go, we call it the vacation of a lifetime, or we go on a trip that we thought would be normal, and then we, everything crazy happens on that trip. We come back and we say that was the trip of a lifetime, and or you get a job opportunity that you never thought you would be able to ever have, and it's the job of a lifetime or the position of a lifetime. We have those moments in our life where we think, "Wow, what did I do to deserve this? This is such a doorway, such an opportunity for me. I can't believe this is happening for me." And you could almost say that that with opportunities of a lifetime, it is, it's a sense of destiny that's connected to that opportunity, a sense of purpose, almost like you were born for this, that this is something that was planned as part of your life before you were ever born. It was attached to your purpose. This opportunity was something beyond normal. And I'm telling you that because in the Christmas story, every person in that story had an opportunity of a lifetime to be involved in this. Obviously, Mary 
uh, 17 years old, according to historians. This is, this is a girl chosen out of every girl in the entire world to be the one that carries the baby Jesus. That's an opportunity of a lifetime. Joseph being chosen to raise Jesus, to actually name him first, call him by name. Uh, this is an opportunity of a lifetime. In fact, Joseph had more encounters with angels than any human being that ever lived in the Bible. So this man had the opportunity of a lifetime when he was chosen by God to be the one to train Jesus up in that house. You obviously have the shepherds. What a moment they had. They were going to be the first people to ever praise him in person in that manger, in that stable. And 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 their their opportunity wasn't just that encounter. They they got to see the sky lit up full of angels and the heavenly host and angels everywhere in the sky. What a moment, what a night. In fact, if I could have be anybody in that story, I would want to be the shepherds because you get to see the warring army of God, the angels and Jesus in the same night, pretty good night. And uh, what a moment, what an opportunity of a lifetime. So you obviously have Anna at the temple who, who prayed and interceded to God for years for this moment. And, and what a moment on the eighth day of Jesus's life when they bring him in to the temple and, and she gets the opportunity of a lifetime to see all of her prayers answered. And Simeon, this old man who said, now I can die because I've truly waited for this moment and this opportunity did not pass me by. It came to me before I died. I got to see the Jesus Christ that everyone had talked about and prophesied. And the wise men, which is who I'm gonna focus on today, what a moment they obviously were going to have too, getting to be chosen by God to pursue this Jesus and to see him and worship him and to come from afar and to give him things. And, and so obviously these people had some kind of great favor from God. And let me just say this about favor. I heard the preacher say this this morning, that favor is something, if you need favor from God, you have to start looking for the favor of God. You can't just want the favor of God. You have to pursue the favor of God. You have to say, God, choose me. I want, I want your blessing in my life. I want your favor in my life. And so what I did notice this week in prayer was that with every opportunity of a lifetime, there are two potential outcomes. Uh, when, you have a, when you have a God opportunity, uh, there's two potential outcomes in that opportunity. Heaven's, heaven's outcome for you is, is destiny, is where you, 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 you flow in your role, that you, you find this is what I was made for, and, and wow, this is what I, I couldn't be happier. I'm living the dream. I'm living for God, and I'm doing everything I was made to do. But the other potential of an opportunity is disaster. That's what hell wants in your life. They want the opportunity that God gives you to be ruined by yourself and by your actions and by your failures and by your mistakes. And so I want to preach to everybody in the room right now, whether you are living the dream or you're living the disaster. I have a word from God for you today that it doesn't matter how bad things are or good things are. God is going to start giving you opportunities to raise you out of the circumstances that you are in and to bless you. God is, oh, shut up. God is not through with you. God is not done with you. God wants to bless you. I come with a word for someone that's in the lowest pit of discouragement, that God is not letting you die because he loves you still. And there's still something else in your life for you to accomplish and something for you to attain. And you must raise your head from the pit and believe that God is with you. I challenge you to lift up your head, O ye gates, and be lifted up ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. And who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Stop being discouraged. 2020 is coming, and something great's gonna come to you. You've gotta make up your mind. I've got a destiny. I've got a purpose. I've got something to live for. I've got something to reach for. I can't quit right now because God has something for my future. If you believe it, would you clap your hands and thank the Lord for that? Something's gonna come to you. Something's gonna bless you. Hallelujah. 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 I feel the Holy Ghost across this nation right now. It's amazing how uh, Mary, her, her opportunity could be destiny, obviously, getting to carry Jesus and everything goes smoothly. But, but if she does the wrong thing, it becomes disaster. If she tells the wrong person, it becomes disaster. If she lets her whereabouts known to the wrong people, everything is aborted and she is done and she blows it and everything is lost. And so she's got this responsibility. You must understand that with every great opportunity, comes great responsibility with every great moment that God can do something for you. You've got to go into another level of maturation where you say, I can't be like I've always been. 
this opportunity demands me to think differently, to act differently, to do more for God. See, some, some days and weeks and years can come and go, and you can stay at that same level that you're at. But when big doors open, you've got to say, I've got to grow up now. It's done, I'm done thinking like a child. I've got to be a man. I've got to be a woman. I've got to man up on this. I've got to think differently and become different for what the opportunity is. And so Mary, she, she can blow this if she messes up. And so she's got to protect that baby. She had to ponder every little word that came to her. And she had to be very protective of this miracle. Joseph, he had destiny. He gets to be the guy that raises Jesus. But if he divorces her, if he says, I'm not going to marry you, I, I'm going to put you away privately. And I, I'm going to disconnect myself from this. I don't want to be, a t I don't want my reputation ruined by your by your actions, I, all of a sudden now he aborts everything that God had planned for him and his life becomes nothing. He becomes a, a stat on a page that no one ever knows about because he would be, make a disaster of an opportunity. Listen to me. When God is doing something in your life, you can't afford to stay in the flesh and think the way you've always thought. You've got to raise your thinking to the spirit and say, God, help me to be somebody different than what I've always been so I can handle what you're trying trying to give me. Amen. Obviously, the shepherds, what a moment. They, they, how, how can they ruin? I'll tell you how they could ruin their moment. If they slept that night, <laughs> Jacob slept his encounter away. He said, surely the Lord is in this, was in this place, and I knew it not. He was, the Lord is right here, and I, I had no idea because I was sleeping. That's why you can't afford to be a statue and sleep during church because you have no idea what's trying to come to you and help you and deliver you and reach you in your circumstance. Mm. <laughs> what a moment. What a moment. And, and Anna, Anna prayed all those years and Simeon prayed all those years. And if they start doubting the promise and say, well, God's never going to do it. God, I guess it wasn't the will of God. I guess God's not going to come through. I guess that was never God. That must have been me thinking that. And they start burying that and they start living without a dream. It's dangerous when you live without a dream. It's dangerous when you live about without a, some kind of purpose in your life. When you just try to exist, you've got to get out of that thinking that I'm just existing on this planet. You're not just existing. You're full of the Holy Ghost. You've been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. He has a plan and a purpose for your life. If you were done, you would be dead. But because you're not dead, it means he's not done with you. And so therefore you must continue to lift that vision. Something good is coming. I can't quit praying. I can't quit praying for my loved one. I can't walk away. I can't skip church. I can't backslide. This might be the service where he comes in the building and everything I've been praying for manifests. And I realize I wasn't the fool this entire time. God had been holding on to what he promised me. And now he's delivering it to me. Hmm. But these wise men, these wise men, their opportunity came two years later. I, I know we sing about the wise men and they're around the manger. They weren't around the manger. He was two years old. They, that's why I said they saw him in the house. He was never in the stable when they saw him. But their, their encounter, their opportunity was massive because it took two years to get there. They had to cross several countries, according to historians, crossing borders to get to where Jesus was. And, and so this, what, what, what a moment to be chosen to look at a sky and see a star and the star moves and it, it, it lets you know when to move. It's almost like they were the people of Israel back in the day when the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud would move and they would move. And, and now this star is leading these wise men. They're going to be the ones to worship the Lord Jesus. They have a moment with destiny. I mean, they, they're preparing for it. They're, they've made up their mind. I'm going all the way. I don't care how long it takes. And I'm going to get there. I, I, these are the church people that, that make up their mind. I don't care what distractions come or what heaviness has come. I'm going to get there. I'm going to see him. And I'm, I'm going to make it happen. And I'm going to be at church on Sunday. I'm not going to skip because I don't feel good. I'm going to be in the presence of God. You're a wise man and a wise woman when you're making up your mind. I've got to get to Jesus. I've got to get to the presence of God no matter what else happens. And so... You know, hell, hell, they, there's some people hell just can't stop. They, and, and, but, but it doesn't mean they don't fight you. They, they know if I can't stop you, I, I have to distract you. That's, that's the, if, if they can't stop you, uh, they will try to distract you. In other words, uh, it's, a, it's, it's, they're going to see Jesus, but somewhere in their journey, when they entered into Judah, they, they said, well, let's go see this other king on our journey, this Herod, 
And let, it's, it's, it's dangerous when you start trying to impress people when you're actually trying to pursue Jesus. Because it's very difficult to pursue people and Jesus at the same time. And if you want the favor of God, sometimes you lose the favor of people. But if you want the favor of people, sometimes you lose the favor of God. And so they said, we're going to try to do both. <laughs> we're going to try to pursue Jesus and impress Herod at the same time. And it's a very scary thing when hell can distract someone enough to get the mentality that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get to Jesus, but I got all these other things going on in my life right now. And I, I, I want to I be faithful pastor, but you see, I don't want to upset this loved one in my house. And I, I want to be at church all the time, but I, I don't want to offend her. And I don't want to, I, I would come to the altar, but my spouse is uncomfortable with that. So I don't want to bother her or bother him while I try to pursue God. You need to make up your mind who you're pursuing. Are you pursuing the favor of someone that God made? Or are you pursuing the God that made the person? Mm. Mm. <laughs> it's difficult to impress Herod if you're pursuing Jesus. Let me just say this for some young people, maybe some not so young people. It's difficult to get really go after God with all your heart if you're still trying to impress the world at the same time. If you're really trying to live for God, if you're gonna be you're gonna struggle if you're trying to live for God and live in the world at the same time. It's dangerous how many people serve two kings. It's dangerous how many people of God have two kings in their life. The king that they worship at church and the king that they impress in the world. It's dangerous when you go to church and you really want to give Jesus everything, but then you stop by Herod's house on the way home. I'll, let me break it down for you. It's dangerous when you worship God in church, but never get over your addiction after church. It's dangerous when you say, God, help me and deliver me. But I really don't want to change when I'm at my house when nobody's around. I want to impress Jesus, but I want to impress my flesh and impress the world, too. It's the spirit of Herod that says, go ahead and go to church. I can't stop you. I know you believe God is real. I know you think you need him, so I can't stop you. But while you go, don't, don't get delivered from your addiction. Don't get delivered from that anger that you've always had and, and that laziness you've always had and that attitude you've always had and that pride you've always had. Go ahead and go to church, but make sure you come back to me when you're done. And we've got too many people in church right now that have got another king outside the church at their house that they try to impress and they try to please. And that's why you're getting nowhere with God when you're trying to do both at the same time. You've got to make up your mind. Are you going to serve God or are you going to serve the world? Are you going to serve God or are you going to serve money? Are you going to serve God or are you going to serve your job? You've got to make up your mind. God is the king of everything in my world. Nothing else matters but getting closer to him. Hallelujah. They said, we're going to go impress this king. And they get there, and they start talking to him. Now, here's why the king got so insecure. The opening statement they made messed him up. And that said, they said, we're looking for this Jesus that is born king of the Jews. Those two words right there bothered him. Born king. You see, Herod wasn't born king. He was born prince. Because when you're, this, by the way, kills the Trinity, by the way. If you're born into royalty, if you're a male, you are born as a prince. Or if you're a female, as a princess, because there's a separate father already ruling the kingdom. But if you're, if you're born king, you're not, you're not the son of something. You are that something. And so he said, we're, we're looking for the one that was born king. And Herod was born a prince. So what they were telling Herod was, he's already starting off more powerful than you were when you were born as a prince of the nation. And it bothered him because he said, wait a second, I had to go through all kind of things to become king. How can this guy be king as soon as he's born? Because the one that they're calling King Herod is not some friend or some person that you know. This is the God that created heaven and the earth. This is the one that formed man from the dust of the ground. And he has now become a living soul walking this planet. And they said, we know him because he's been born king. And it bothered him. It made him insecure. It made him worried. It panicked him. He said, whoa. In fact, it said he was troubled. All of Israel, they were all bothered by this because the wise men said, we were searching this guy that, that has all power and authority. And he was just born in the world. And, and all of a sudden, the Bible said Herod called them away privately or privately. Your Herod, here's how you know it's your Herod. Your other king, 
The other king in your life always wants to talk to you when no one's around. The, here's how you know you've got a Herod. You've got something else in your life besides God. It always shows up when no one's around. Where you struggle when no one's around, that's your Herod. That's the thing that wants your attention when you're not in the altar, but you're in the car by yourself, or you're in the house by yourself, or you're on the phone by yourself. Herod wants that attention privately. That's the, that's that spirit of the world. Oh, go ahead and worship God and act like you're fine in church when you're really struggling with this when no one's around. That's the Herod. He said, come over here alone. Mm. Listen to me. Let me help you with something. If you're, ha if you're struggling with your idle time, because idle time is the devil's playground, start praying about your idle time before you have it. Say, God, don't let me fall to that stuff of Herod. When I'm by myself, help me to think differently. Help me to worship you rather than worship what I always worship when no one's around. God, help me to walk on the water that I always sink in when no one's around. Give me victory over the Herod in my life. Is there someone that needs victory over a Herod in that building right now? I'm staring at several of you and I can see your faces from here. I can see the addictions in that room. You need to make up your mind. I want some victory in 2020. I don't want this to be an annual service where I go once a year to Jesus and I give him my heart and I say I love you and then I skip church until Easter or I skip church for three or four weeks. You're not doing right when you do that. You're not going to go to heaven thinking like that. You've got to make up your mind. Who is king in your life who's the real god that you serve are you serving the lord jesus or are, are you serving money are you serving fame are you serving what you want in your flesh you have to desire god more than anything somebody you have to desire god more than anything this is an opportunity of a lifetime every church service that you go to is an opportunity of a lifetime every altar call that you go to is the opportunity of a lifetime to be changed forever hallelujah Hallelujah. So now, Herod says, you go worship him. When you're done, come back to my house. Tell me where he is so I can go worship him. He wanted to kill him, obviously. So watch this. So now, you're following the star, but you're being followed by soldiers. So you, so destiny and disaster are about to rumble for these wise men's life right here, because destiny is saying, "Come on," and disaster is saying, "We got it. We we picked up where they're weak at. We picked up on their weakness. They're not all the way committed to this Jesus. They they were committed for a while, but they can be distracted to a point where they're not all the way in. So so let's 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 see who's going to win the battle for your soul. Is it going to be the will of God or is it going to be the will of Herod? Is it going to be the will of the Lord Jesus or the will of your flesh? And, and so they're they're going after him now but now something's on their trail you got to be careful when something's on your trail because hell wants to take out everything that you get in the house of god that's why you can't afford to to not go to the altar or not worship god because hell's following you and watching you and every encounter that you have is a moment that you can turn everything around on the devil and so they go to him and now they get into the presence of the king of the world what a moment what an opportunity, because now you are worshiping the one who made you. He's only two years old, but yet they're worshiping him. And by the way, this is how you know you're really in with Jesus, when you worship him, when he can do nothing for you. When, 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 you see, if, any, if you worship him because you need the job, or you need the raise, or you need the answer, anyone can do that. But when you worship him, knowing he's not going to do one thing for me, you know you're committing yourself to him. You know there's something powerful about the relationship that you value because you're saying I've got to have him more than anything. He may not answer my prayer but I get to be in his presence and that matters more than anything in this world. He may not heal my body but he at least I get to go to church. He may not have done what I wanted him to do in my family but at least I get to be in the house of God surrounded by my brothers and sisters in the house of the Lord. I really know this is important when he can do nothing for me but yet I still worship him at the same dimension and the same capacity capacity and so they're worshiping him and they're praising him and now watch this because you know we always preach it that that that, that they took out their gold and and their frankincense and their myrrh like it, we almost preach it like like that was the intent the entire time that they were going to bring this stuff to jesus the only problem with that is that was their trading goods to get to where jesus was and to get home from where jesus was when they crossed borders 
of nations, they had to present something to get, be allowed in the nation. The gold and the frankincense and the myrrh was their trading barters to get home. It was never meant for Jesus. But when they were in the presence of Jesus, they knew we've got to give him more than what we plan to give him because he is worthy of everything that we have, everything that we can give him. We must do more than what we thought we were going to do. He shot Talamosataya. Hallelujah. Somebody clap your hands and worship him right now. I feel the Holy Ghost in this room. Bible says that, that they opened up their treasures. And the Bible says, also says that where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. In other words, they opened up all their hearts and they said, here's what we have. We don't even know if we're going to get home now. We don't even know if we're ever going to see our family again. We don't even know if we're ever going to get back to our people. But we know one thing. When we get into the presence of this king, it's different than the presence of the other king. The other king we left just fine. But with this king, there's something that draws me that says, give him everything. Why? Because he's worthy. And listen, if you're in the presence of God right now and you don't feel like he's worthy, you've forgotten what he's done for you. You've forgotten that he died on a cross for your sin. You've forgotten that he shed blood for you. You've forgotten that he's filled you with his spirit and he's redeemed you. We are so blessed to give him everything that we have and everything that we are. It's the opportunity of a lifetime. They give him everything. And they go to sleep. Destiny wins the battle over disaster. Because the angel of the Lord comes down and says, you're going to go home a different way than the way you came. I know you've, been, uh, you've had encounters before where you just came to church and went home the same way. But this is an opportunity of a lifetime. And this encounter with Jesus, let me tell you something. One encounter with Jesus can make you leave in a different way than every way you've ever come in before. One encounter with God can make you a different person than the person you were when you walked in that building. And they said, we're going to go a different way. Heaven has won the battle. Hell has been defeated. When you make up your mind to give everything to Jesus, that's Destiny wins and disaster dies because there's something powerful when you say, I, don't, I know I'm a failure. I know I've messed things up. I know I've dropped the ball. But, oh, God, if you've got one more thing for me, let it be destiny. Let me find my purpose in this life. And I commit myself to it. I commit myself to this church. I commit myself to being faithful. I commit myself to living right in 2020. I commit myself to giving you everything that I have. I commit myself to you. Here are the treasures of my heart. A few weeks ago, the Lord spoke this through our, our pastor here. And Lord, he spoke, a, he was telling a story about Jonah. And I want to say this to someone right now because I feel the Holy Ghost. There's someone in the room that you feel like you've already blown it. You've messed up every opportunity. You've done everything wrong and nothing right. You, you, you feel like a failure on the inside because of all the mistakes you've made. But I want to hear, I want to tell you something my pastor said. He said when Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days, he had failed God. He had ruined everything God anointed him to do. His purpose, his destiny was to preach at Nineveh. His destiny was to save a city, but he blew it. He said, I'll do my own thing. He ran from God. And there are people in that room what, looking at me right now, and you're running from God. You're running from God's will. You're running from living right. You're running from a prayer life, and you're running from being consecrated. And Jonah said, I'm going to do my own things. And it, Isn't it funny how when the whale swallowed him, he entered a season of darkness because when you run from God, you run to the dark. When you run from God, you lose the light. When you run from God, you lose everything God has for you and you make a mess of everything. And now he can't get out of it. He can't fix it himself. He doesn't know what to do. He, there's no one he can call to change it. He's made a disaster of what could be his destiny. But here's what my, the pastor said. He made one little statement. He said, but when God threw that whale up and made the whale throw up. He did not give Jonah a second chance at uh, salvation. He gave him a second chance at destiny. He said, I'm going to throw you up right at where you're going to preach and you're going to go to Nineveh like I always planned for you. You're going to be anointed like I always had you anointed and you're going to preach the gospel and Jonah saved 600,000. 
thousand people in one message because his destiny was calling him. And even though he had blown it with disaster, the mercy of God is bigger than your disaster. It's bigger than your past. It's bigger than your failures. It's bigger than your mistakes. And it can pull you out of anything and put you into what he's planned for you. Somebody praise him right now. There's a Holy Ghost anointing in there. God has a plan for your life. Let destiny win. Let disaster die. I'm about done. But let me tell you that Esther, when she had that one chance for destiny, when she stood before the king, she had one chance to save her people. She had one chance to tell him that, hey, we're, they, they're going to kill us. You've got to save us. And she takes her one chance, and she didn't have the confidence to reach for what she wanted. She didn't have the confidence to ask for what she wanted, even though the Bible says, ask and you shall receive. She was afraid to ask him. And you know when she went home that night, even though she asked him to come over to a banquet she thought i blew it i ruined my destiny what if he cancels me what if something comes up i i I had a chance i had a chance to tell him and i was in his presence and i didn't bring up my need i didn't bring up the situation that was so real how could i be so foolish to be in the presence of the king and not pray like i should pray have you ever felt that way how could i waste this church service how he was in the room and i didn't do anything about it i said i'll just come back later i have another opportunity later just do something later god and so he's and he comes over and and she here's her chance and she's and she doesn't have the confidence again and she blows her second chance at destiny and says i oh just come over one more time you're supposed to ask for your people to be saved esther you're supposed to ask for your life to be spared it's your destiny it's why you're on the earth it's why you're the queen it's for this moment everything has been for this moment and you're blowing it while you delay because of fear and worry and she asked the wrong question and now here oh, I had two chances he's not going to come tonight he could he could anything could happen he's going to say what's wrong with you but no oh, you serve a god that doesn't just give you second chances at destiny you can have a third chance at destiny a fourth chance at destiny i don't know who i'm preaching to but you feel like you've completely failed god but there's something you need to know god still has a plan for your life. Listen, the Bible says, though a righteous man falls seven times. Number seven means complete. There's a reason why he said seven and not three. Or six. Seven times. In other words, if you're a complete failure... If you fall so many times that you've completely fallen and you can't get up on your own, you can't fix it, God has mercy to pull you up one more time. And you might be in the back row or the middle of the, the middle section or on the sides staring at me. Some of you haven't moved the entire time, not because you're, you don't feel anything, but you are bound by failure. You are bound by pain and by mistakes. But the Lord has sent me to tell you that in 2020, he's going to send a doorway to you of opportunity. You're not in this service by accident. God is going to bless you and anoint you, but you've got to get up from the ground and you've got to say, I am going to believe God. God, I'm going to try one more time. I have a plan for your life. And someone needs to manifest it. Someone needs to go after it. And someone needs to believe it. Let's stand to our feet right now in that building. Let's all rise and worship the Lord. Can I tell you, you're having the opportunity of a lifetime. Don't waste this moment. Don't waste the opportunities that God's giving you. Don't waste the encounters. Don't waste your prayer meetings. Don't waste this church service. nothing is as important as you making up your mind it's going to be different from now on 
Maybe this is how you've all, maybe you're closing out 2020 or 2019 the way you've closed out every other year. This is just sitting around, not pursuing God. Everything else is more important. Got to find a wife. Got to find a husband. Got to get this. Got to have that. And you're pursuing it the wrong way. Let me tell you, God has everything you need. God has the wife you need. He has the husband you need. He has the relationships you need. But you've got to make up your mind. This is an opportunity of a lifetime to go after Jesus with everything I have. And if you'll do that, you will not have to worry again about what you've been worrying about. It's sad. I must say this as I close. It is sad when people come to church once a year, twice a year, once every few months. They're not, tra- they're not bad people. They're no. good people. They're, they need to be saved. But something is convincing them that they'll never be or have what they want to have or want to be. Yes. I don't even know who's yes. in that room. Yes. I, I can barely see half of you. But I will tell you this right now from Florida all the way there. The Lord has told me all week to tell you that you're about to have a second chance at your destiny. Uh, yes. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I know it's Christmas service, but I feel like the Lord's been using me right now to tell somebody in the room it's time to believe God one more time. It's time to try harder. It's time to reach God where you've been. It's time to ask God, bring my destiny, bring my purpose, bring the plan of your will into my life so I can be what you want me to be. I can do what you want me to be. I know I'm not a woman who works hard for you. I'm about to ask you, I know I'm not a woman who works hard for you. I can't lay hands on you, but I'm asking you to do what you want me to do. I can't lay hands on you, but I'm asking you to do what you want me to do. I can't lay hands on you, but I'm asking you to do what you want me to do. I can't lay hands on you, but I'm asking you to do what you want me to do. I can't lay hands on you, but I'm asking you to do what you want me to do. I can't lay hands on you, but I'm asking you to do what you want me to do. I can't lay hands on you, but I'm asking you to do what you want me to do. I can't lay hands on you, but I'm asking you to do what you want me to do. I can't lay hands on you, but I'm asking you to do what you want me to do. I can't lay hands on you, but I'm asking you to do what you want me to do. I can't lay hands on you, but I'm asking you to do what you want me to do. I can't lay hands on you, but I'm asking you to do what you want me to do. I can't lay hands on you, but I'm asking you to do what you want me to do. I can't lay hands on you, but I'm asking you to do what you want me to do. I can't lay hands on you, but I'm asking you to do what you want me to do. I can't lay hands on you, but I'm asking you to do what you Say God, no one else hear me but you. I I can't hear no I can't hear no I I Somebody pray right now. Go ahead, Dad. You can take the mic and do what you feel. Would you guys pray with me in the Holy Ghost? In the name of Jesus. Let the Lord bless somebody right now. Let the Lord deliver somebody right now. There's answers to you. There's peace. There's joy coming. Your family has an answer coming. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Yes, Lord, yes, I am here. Yes, Jesus, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. hallelujah. Yes, pray that the altar be filled with worship. The altar be filled with somebody going after God right now. I, I don't know, shut up, I dare you ignore everybody around you. Come on. Yes, I am here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Get in the spirit with me. Get in the spirit with me. Get in the spirit and see what Yes, I am here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Get in the spirit of prayer moving right now. Hallelujah. 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 If you're a guest, I'm preaching to you. You need the Holy Ghost. You need to be baptized in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, you Jesus. You need God to save you from what you're doing. You can, you can have a life of peace if you want it. You need God to intervene in your life. You need God to bless Hallelujah. you. Hallelujah. You need God to step into your world. I love you. May the Lord bless you. That's beautiful. It's all this pressing.
one saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Baptism, then what? Baptism is a burial in water for accountable beings into the remission of sins, for salvation to get into Christ, to become a new creature, to get into the one body. Then, walk in the new life, study and grow, become a servant of righteousness, keep self pure, be an example, have faith in God, follow Jesus, put first things first, Resist temptation, be faithful, and be fruitful.